Good afternoon. I thought that uh, Tony and I are part of Trail and that he would not take part of my time, but obviously he did. Uh, but, uh, but that's okay, it's all in the family. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to all of you for coming uh, to this uh, wonderful symposium um, event. I'd like to thank um, um, Johannes Odenthal, um, Thomas Kruger, Nikita Darwin, and Wolfgang, of course, whom I've known for, for a long time, um, for being so generous with us at, and inviting us to come and be part of this uh, conversation with you. Um, I'll be remiss if I don't mention um, the names of Karina Thora and Judith Weber, who were behind the scenes in making sure that we, we got here safely and soundly. So I want to say thank you uh, to one and all. Um, a lot of the themes that I'm going to talk about have been touched upon, so I will tailor my talk to, to take into account uh, some of the issues uh, that have been discussed. Um, any discussion about human rights is fraught with danger, uh, especially if one is coming at it from a critical perspective. Uh, because you know there is a small place in hell that is reserved for human rights heretics. Um, but my view has always been that uh, the university is not a church. It is not a synagogue or a mosque. It's a place where we are allowed to think irresponsibly because it's only irresponsible thought that permits us sometimes, uh, if rarely, to get to the truth. Um, and society understands that by making the bargain with us as academics that uh, they may be getting perhaps 5% of the loaf, not 90%. Um, and so you take that caveat um, uh, uh, as a part of my the deal with me standing here talking to you. Um, let me say that this is a bold uh, attempt uh, by the Academy um, of Arts and the Center for Constitutional and Human Rights to interrogate a subject um, that is very complicated and that is difficult. It is not every day, really, that a European or North American or North Atlantic international legal scholars and thinkers interrogate a school of thought whose purpose, whose central kernel, is not only to critique international law, but also to dismantle some of its basic assumptions, to de deconstruct them, to reimagine them, um, and then to dare to reconstruct them. But I would argue that this is a sort of synergistic and symbiotic scholarly enterprise that Twayo has been calling for. If we are going to have, have any hope at all um, of turning uh, hegemonic thoughts that feed and fortify political and economic hegemonies uh, into a, um, a more palatable uh, humanistic um, a regime of thought. And so today, I want to say it's a special day for those of us who have toiled uh, in the academic wilderness and without serious partners uh, in the academy of the global north. And I want to commend all of you for trying to be partners with us. Um, because we are discussing and interrogating the Poyo argument about international law. And I can tell you uh, for a fact that when we began this process of thinking um, counterintuitively about international law some uh, 20 years ago with Tony and others, uh, there were no takers. There were no people who were interested in hearing what we had to say. So today it's a measure of gratitude for me to hear, for example, Wolfgang you know, cite my piece and cite Tony's work uh, as uh, 
uh, scholarship that uh, you ought to pay attention to. Now, I want to talk about the crisis in human rights. Now, the last uh, half of the 20th century, as you all know, uh, was undoubtedly, in terms of public discourse, in terms of the academy, and in terms of the practice of international law, the golden era of human rights. No less an authority than Lewis Henkin, the professor at Columbia Law School who passed away some time ago, uh, one of the key intellectual leaders of the human rights movement, who dubbed our age or our period the age of rights, the age of rights. He wrote, and I quote, that human rights is the idea of our time, the only political moral idea that has received universal acceptance in our time. Philip Austin, a leading contemporary thinker and scholar of human rights, has argued that naming a claim a human right elevates it above the rank and fire of competing societal goals and bestows upon it an aura of timelessness, of absoluteness, and of universal validity. Now, obviously, these are very strong claims. But one critique of these strong claims is that they are part of an echo chamber. They are grandiose statements made by insiders, those with an interest in depicting human rights as a kind of summit or a zenith of human civilization. But what is not in doubt as we sit here today is that there has been a cascade of norms, of processes, and of institutions propagating human rights since the Second World War. And we know that these have mushroomed everywhere at the universal, regional, and even at the national levels, uh, even in states where the genre of rights was not indigenous to the native tongue. The United Nations became, uh, as Tony alluded to, the global champion of the human rights crusade around the world. Within states, national constitutions increasingly took the normative content of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other key international human rights texts. So seen from this perspective, it will be difficult for me to stand up here and argue that human, the human rights idea has not been phenomenally successful. But it will be foolish of me to pretend without any qualification that the 20th century was indeed the human rights epoch. Because even as the seeds and sinews of human rights were planted worldwide, the last half of the century proved to be one of the most brutal eras of our time. Genocides were committed in many countries, including Cambodia, in Yugoslavia, in Iraq, in Rwanda, and in Uganda. Unspeakable, unspeakable crimes were carried out in many other countries, including Argentina, Chile, and South Africa. And as the century closed, the international community adopted the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, the first permanent tribunal designed to bring about the accountability of, of the perpetrators of the most heinous uh, crimes, no matter their, their high stations in government and society. What we do know for a fact is that by the end of the last century, much of this enthusiasm that had characterized the surge of the human rights movement since the 1970s had cooled down. In a word, human rights seem to have failed to deliver a utopian world. Uh, in fact, the first decade of the first half, the first decade and a half, rather, of the 21st century, brought about several dystopian catastrophes. The ugly American-led war in Iraq, which Tony again uh, referred to, uh, and, and, and of course the American-led war in Afghanistan. The descent into untold brutalities in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Sudan, and the, and the slaughter of hundreds of thousands in Syria. <clears throat> 
Now, while the language of, of human rights had become ubiquitous, its power to mobilize outrage and action seemed to fade and seemed to have no impact on these dystopian catastrophes. And one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves is why did the human rights language lose the potency to mobilize global outrage and to rally people to action? And there are some reasons that I would like to share with you. And we can argue about those reasons when we uh, you know, have a back and forth. First of all, creeds and ideologies that overpromise inevitably over underperform and are bound to suffer uh, public fatigue. Human rights, I think, is one such ideology. I call it an ideology because it's a moral, legal, political, and economic schema with an intended outcome and intended consequences. It is moral because it propagates a set of beliefs that assume the innate nature of humans. And even if we assume that human rights themselves, the discourse of rights themselves, are skeptical about the innate goodness of the human being, they assume that our worst proclivities as human beings will give way to our better angels if we live in a particular civilizational legal order. So in a sense, there is this messianic germ uh, in the language of rights and in the schema of human rights. Its chief authors and proponents want to depict and have depicted human rights in almost biblical spiritual terms. For example, uh, Professor Steiner and Professor uh, Austin have referred to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as, quote, the parent document, the initial burst of idealism and enthusiasm, terser, more general and grander than the treaties, in some sense, the constitution of the entire movement. Uh, professor Marian Glendon, whom some of you may know, the Harvard Law School professor, went even further and argued that the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, is, quote, already showing signs of having achieved the status of holy writ within the human rights movement. Now, these views have been widely shared within the human rights movement, and particularly within international non-governmental organizations based in the West. Within these circles, and the foreign policy establishments of the West, including here in Germany. Uh, fundam the fundamental belief in human rights has been a formal article of faith. Uh, scholars in the West and advocates of human rights in the West and their acolytes in the global South have been akin to a choir in church. Advocacy and events of rights is done with a zeal, a religious zeal. The reason is that human rights have become the moral argument for the liberal project. It's an ideology and an argument that seeks to refine political democracy, the rule of law, individual rights, constitutionalism, and free markets, all in that bundle. You take it together or leave it. Professor Thomas Frank um, argued forcefully that human rights are universal and require a Western-style democratic government for their achievements. Professor Frank did not hide the ball. These scholars have contended that going back to John Locke, the West was able to discover the genius of the good society the genius of the good society by actualizing the liberal project. They have regarded many critiques of the human rights discourse as heresy. But even so, and it's been very lonely up there, 
I must argue that the human rights idea has failed to gain complete submission, has failed to gain complete sub submission in cultures and traditions outside the West. And this is true in Asia, it's true in the Muslim world, and it's true in Africa. Although I will talk about some nuances there. And I would like to say that this failure to achieve this total submission uh, of human rights by cultures elsewhere, outside the, uh, the, the, the global north, is a consequence of the deficits, the normative, the philosophical, and the cultural deficits uh, in the human rights project itself. And I want to say that it is these deficits, and I take no pleasure in saying this, but it is these deficits that raise the question about the end of the human rights era. The end of the human rights era. Uh, if you look at the practice of the project, especially by states in a global north, you're going to see a lot of duplicity and hypocrisy. Quite apart from the question that I've already talked about, the crisis of universality that has dogged the movement from the beginning. Okay. Now, the most damning, I think, charge against the UN-driven human rights project has been its European Western parentage and normative basis. Now, I don't want to say that we should um, be in the business of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I want to say that there has been some attempts to address some of these deficits. And like Tony, I would like to say that uh, you, know, you try to excavate and mine what is good and throw overboard what is not good to see if you can reconstruct uh, a better project. But even with those attempts to try to excavate what is good in human rights and to mend it, it's clear to me and to those of us who think about human rights that the challenges that these deficits raise have not been successfully answered. The human rights movement remains largely a cultural possession of the West. In spite of the language, in spite of the Adoption of this language by various peoples around the world for combating, or the adoption of this language as material for combating political despotism uh, by activists and others. But the failure of the movement to effectively blunt the charge of these deficits, I think, has contributed enormously to its decline. Um, then there's a question that I have, that I have alluded to, uh, that one of double standards. What critics see as the hypocrisy of the West. The West has been accused of being guilty of the same abuses of human rights that it condemns other states for perpetuating. In particular, the West has been called to account for using human rights language and human rights policies within their governments to advance their narrow foreign policy objectives. In other cases, the West has flouted human rights norms with impunity. We all know what happened during the Cold War where the West coddled right-wing fascist dictatorships across the globe, even as it condemned the excesses of the Soviet bloc and China. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, we all know what happened in Iraq and Afghanistan. We know that it's indisputable that George W. Bush 
invaded Iraq on a non-existent pretext of weapons of mass destruction. And there's little doubt that in, in, in the ensuing carnage, the United States committed war crimes and mass atrocities. And similar crimes have been committed in Afghanistan. Lethal American drone strikes that I think Tony also talked about against terror suspects have often killed innocents and raised serious questions about their legality. And then there is, of course, Guantanamo, uh, where the indefinite detention of Al Qaeda suspects in what is effectively a black hole has raised serious questions about whether the United States is a rule of law state. And I think in the midst of all of this, hypocrisy and duplicity, one of the pains in my heart is that fellow scholars like yourselves in the global north have not joined hands with us to excavate and to expose um, these abuses. The bridges, I think, that have been built to find a more universal human rights language have come primarily from advocates in the global south and even from states in the global south. And I just want here to cite uh, the African human rights system, which has many problems I know, so don't, don't attack me for it. But one cannot gainsay or uh, dispute the fact that the African Charter has made some important innovative advances, normatively in a human rights language. And that, the human rights, uh, and that the African Charter has been responsible for reducing somewhat the credibility gap or the legitimacy gap for human rights uh, in Africa. Um, but this has not been true elsewhere. It is certainly not true in the Middle East, it is not true in Asia, and it is not, not true in majority Muslim and Arab countries. Um, you know, and so I would like to say that the cultural terrain has been fiercely you know, contested by protagonists on both sides. At times, religion has been used as a trump, and uh, there's no pun intended, as a trump to chip away at the legitimacy of human rights. Um, but I, was, I would have to say that all of these examples that I've given have played a very large role in undermining the legitimacy of the human rights movement. In some quarters, human rights have come to be seen as a tool to justify a new imperialism by the West of a darker peoples. It's been accused of being a tool for the maintenance of an unjust global order, which is the exact opposite of what it claims is Rison Datra to be. Okay? So there's fatigue, and there's persistence of privation. And there's no doubt in my mind that the high watermark of the human rights movement has passed. But I'm not celebrating. Because other forms of geopolitics and moral, moral equivalence have taken over. Uh, where human rights left. And one of those uh, geopolitical moral imp uh, imp imp equivalents has been the war on terror and what the war on terror has done in terms of retarding uh, the development of human rights. It seemed, for example, that in the United States, um, the government was determined to go to any lengths to justify human rights violations in the names of fighting terror, including on Americans. And as a consequence, authoritarian dictatorships elsewhere took America's flouting of international law as a carte blanche to commit the most heinous atrocities. I would say that deep disillusionment has followed. <clears throat> 
activists in human rights, I don't know what they're in, Ger in Germany too, and true believers of human rights have fallen into deep despair. And you come and tell me if you have not in despair. Because the language of rights, which at one point carried some purchase and, and some potency, has become a byword for futility in the face of atrocity. You all know what I'm talking about. Concepts of compassion and donor fatigue are part of the political lexicon. When you talk about the waves of migrations of people from the global south coming to Europe, you see Europeans turn the other way. Except I might say that here in Germany, the chancellor appeared to have taken a very bold stand, which also has cost her politically. Um, so on the question of globalization, of which the human rights movement is a part, and of which uh, my, my friend and colleague Tony talked about, um, on that question, globalization has quickened in the last several decades. Hundreds have been lifted from poverty because of globalization. But hundreds more have been ravaged by free markets gone amok. As a consequence, I think we are facing a moment in history of paralysis, a moral paralysis. The great powers of the day, whether they be Russia, they have become ravenous with the first-born accession of Crimea and attempts to occupy eastern Ukraine. Or they are paralyzed with complexity and nativism like the United States with this election of Donald Trump. It seemed to us that there is no way out in a Syrian crisis. So this multipolar world in which we live today has created many competing interests, which have pushed human rights down in the scale of the important interests for global powers. You know, what is left is a language. Human rights are still invoked by powerful states in the West. But increasingly, it is an invocation that is hortatory and obligatory, and it's not sincere. It is not sincere. The question for us is now, as we look in the back, in the rear view mirror of the human rights era, what are we going to do? What is our response going to be? What do people like myself, who are in the prayer movement, have to say about this moral vacuum that we now face? We have no language, whether in law or in politics, to talk about a better tomorrow. Forget about the SDGs. That is just sweet talk. What language are we going to use to rally ourselves to confront these new outrages? Does trail still matter? Can trail help us to a safe harbor? So in the last few minutes of my talk, I just want to focus on this question. So trail, as has been alluded to by my colleagues, um, asks us to think of international law as a regime of a hegemony, but not as a regime of hegemony that is irredeemable. Um, the way I think Tony Angel put it is, you know, it is here to stay. Let's work with it. I mean, that's a crude way of translating what you say, Tony. And our charge, and my charge and you, is to rethink within trail to think how international law can be reformulated. What can we do to decolonize and deconstruct 
not just international law, not just human rights, but all law. Because the problem is not just human rights. It is not just international law. It's all law. It's an ideational problem. How do we dissenter law and legal discourses and then we politicize law? Can we dissenter it on the one hand and then repoliticize it? Now, law professors like myself, and hopefully I'm not in that category, but law professors like myself, not me, uh, are guilty of perpetuating and entrenching several myths and lies about law. And I understand from a German audience, and many of you are German, and there are professors here, and there are students who are impressionable, so I'm gonna be careful about what I say. But let us remember that law, the law is an ass, understood only as the animal, and not the American equivalent of the same word. Okay? This means that the law, in my view, is rigid and stupid. It is rigid because of, it is positivistic. It, is, it tends to cast itself in stone. Okay? And it is stupid because it is not self-critical. The law does not reflect upon itself. Okay? That, so the first thing that I think we have to do as lawyers is tell the truth to our students. That one, the law is an ass, and two, that the law is stupid. Okay? Because unless we start there, we cannot begin to talk about decolonizing the law. Yeah? If we sanctify the law, if we raise it above other societal phenomena, we cannot decolonize and deconstruct it. So first of all, we need to talk to knock down that totem of the law, okay? It's an ass. And we need to bear in mind that these are two fundamental flaws, okay? In addition to that, to these two flaws, the law is also burdened by several myths. Several myths. And one of them, again, my colleague, uh, 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 Professor Angie, talked about. And one of them is this difficulty that we have of separating the law from the snooty view of the colonial project. You know, the snooty view of the colonial project, snooty just being know it all was that law is central to human civilization. I would like us to challenge this thought that law is central to human civilization. I'm not sure about that. Law has been central, I know, to human atrocities. I do not know whether it's been central to human civilization. It is this same myth that separates pre-law and, and law societies, and then makes the argument that pre-law societies can be possessed by law societies. That's why we are able to talk about African customary law or African societies as law-free and outside the realm of modernity, and therefore subject to colonization. This is a chasm between the primitive and the civilized, the superior and the subordinate, the Orient and the Occident. And I, I want to note that this is really at the core of the white man's burden. And this is the same logic that drove the law and development movement. And it is a process that others, it's an othering process that in the case of Africa, for example, it Africanizes and seeks to westernize. And I'm afraid that many of our, you know, uh, my fellow scholars and academics in law from the global south have swallowed this um, philosophy, line, hook, and sinker. And partly because most of, most of them were trained uh, most of the Global South professors were trained um, 
through the prism of Eurocentrism. The other problem is this argument that the law is the opposite of politics. And I think Treo should contest or contest this argument. And that for human rights, we have, contest the, we have to contest the argument that law is the opposite of politics. Because this view denies that law is politics. And here I'm addressing specifically my German colleagues. It's a denial that unlike politics, law has an inherent sanity in it. It is neutral, it is unbiased, it is impartial. This is a myth. This elevation of the law about politics sanctifies law and makes it unassailable as a construct that stands above society as unquestionable. It is basically a tool for demanding intellectual obedience to the state or ratifying the status quo. And it bequeaths the machinery of the state, uh, the law courts, law enforcement, legislation, regime, with legal legitimacy. It denies that the law perpetuates hegemonic interests. The reality is that law is an expression of politics. That law is in essence politics or political in the way it is made, in the way it is implemented, in the way it is interpreted by courts. Think of law as a political claim that has achieved social success and is ratified in the right language. And if you doubt me, look at Trump's executive order banning the entry into the, into the United States of certain individuals from majority Muslim countries. It's the most blatant expression of politics through law. And that is why we can predict, and again, I hope my fellow professors can agree with me here, we can predict with a high degree of certainty how a particular judge is going to rule on a particular case based upon a careful analysis of her political views. We can predict this. Let us not kid ourselves. That is why in the United States Supreme Court, we can always tell when you're looking at a case, whether it's gonna be 5-4 or, you know, 7-0 or 9-0, whatever the case might be. So we must begin to tell the truth that politics precedes law. And if we do that, perhaps we can have some, some, some hope of harvesting uh, harvesting some, uh, um, uh, some elements to help us address this moral vacuum in human rights. Um, a few more comments and then I'll, I'll yield the floor. On the political left, we think of law as an indeterminate. We think of law as a double-edged sword that can cut both ways. So we've also drunk the Kool-Aid because we think you can use the law for good and you can use the law for bad. We think that the law can be used to attack social hierarchies or to freeze them. Uh, we take to, this to mean that we can use the law for social change. But we need to ask ourselves whether this is true or is it only part, partly true? Can, can the law be uh, a tool for liberation? Can the law be a tool for liberation? If you look, for example, at the South African uh, historical example, and you look at the transition from apartheid uh, to, I would not say post-apartheid because, uh, we, we, uh, because apartheid was privatized, and it is still there. What I'm going to ask is, if you look at South Africa during apartheid, And then after 1996, let them just give it a date without characterizing it. You know what has happened in South Africa? That experiment has failed. The attempt to use law as a tool for social change has failed. Okay. For me, South Africa is a quintessential example of why we must draw back from our faith in, in the Human Rights Project. 
because South Africa was the first state, the, 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 the post-1996 state, which I'm not calling post-apartheid, you know, was the first state which was, a, which was the, um, I, I want to say, the, the, the complete product of the human rights movement. Yeah. South Africa could not have been free, could, could not have been possible, not free, but possible without the human rights movement. The, the state that came in 1996. But then look at what, what it has become. You know, the limits of this language to deal with deeply embedded social inequities, the language of rights to excavate social dysfunctions and distortions has completely failed. Um, now, as thinkers, I want us to imagine you know, the notion of a post-liberal society in which law is not central to society, in which law is not frozen, in which law is not neutral. What we've been very good at in the human rights movement is to think about how to contain political despotism. Okay. The idiot means of this world. Okay? The human rights movement was very good at that at some point, instituting the liberal constitution. Okay? But we have been very poor as thinkers in trying to contain and to re-engineer economic despotism. We have failed miserably there. We do not know how to talk about money, if I may be very blunt. We know how to talk about politics, not about money. And if you look at the South African example, that is exactly what happened. People knew how to talk about politics, but not about the economy. So the question is, can we use the law to free ourselves from the shackles of hegemony, from the shackles of the market, and from the pretense of neutrality? So I want, I want to leave with this, with this, with this, with these few words here, that from a total perspective, and I don't come here to offer answers. I come here to provoke and to ask for you to join me in thinking. Human rights need to be repoliticized. That, that is to say that we need to go beyond this idea of politics, okay, as central, and repoliticize human rights and focus our attention on economic despotism. Um, because I think, you know, we have found ways to deal with political despotism, pretty much. And so with those few words, I do not know that you can find any coherence between my talk and, and Tony's talk, but I, I can assure you, I think there's some coherence. Thank you so much. <laughs>